Okay, welcome everyone. Today I'm going to show you a bit the Revenge UI. You will be able to reproduce what I'm going to show you today uh, if you have received an invite. In order to receive an invite, you need to be subscribed to the newsletter and just go, if you're not, just go to rev.ng and click join close beta and eventually you will receive an invite. Uh, we're inv inviting people in batches, so please just be patient and you will be invited. Okay, so let's start and let's just go to cloud.rev.ng. This will load the user interface of Revenge directly in your browser. And today I'd like you to show, I'd like to show you how we can do some reverse engineering on some basic C program. So let's create a, um, a project and we call this my simple program. And this will basically create uh, the project on the cloud. And while it's booting here on the left, you can see the list of projects that are available in your account. And in a second, it will be available. Okay, at this point, we can upload our binary. I can just click and upload my simple binary, which by the way, does not contain uh, the bug information and click and analyze. Basically, Revenge will perform a set of initial auto analysis. So it will try to identify the functions, the arguments and things like that. So basically everything you need to do, to do at the beginning. Once that's done, um, here we can see an overview of the binary. Uh, for instance, there's the architecture the ABI that it's using and link to the entry point and all the segments that are in the binary. On the left here, organized as a file system, there's the views that are available in the UI. Some views concern the whole binary and they are organized under binary. For instance, there's, there's the call graph and some other views instead are specific to a function and are organized down here. For instance, there's the, the, the compiled C code. But yeah, let's start and I will click here and it will bring me to the decompile C code of the entry point. Now, if you're familiar with Linux binaries, the entry point is usually called underscore start. So I will do right click, rename symbol and type underscore start. And yeah, it will get renamed. But yeah, as you can notice, I did a mistake. So I can just do right click, undo, and I can do it again. But in this case, I will just press N, which is the shortcut for renaming and type the correct word. Now here we can see that I'm calling, uh, the, the program is calling libc start main and I can tell you that the first argument is a pointer to the main function. So I will rename this to main. But at this point I changed my mind and maybe I want to get a larger picture of the binary. So I want to take a look at the call graph. So I will go under binary, call graph and the call graph will load. Okay, and yeah, you can see the main function here and you can see that it's calling some other functions, but we can see that it's calling C alloc. Okay, I'm curious about that. So I will press control P and I can type C alloc and I can see all the artifacts related to that function. And in this case, I'm interested in the decompile code. So I will select it and just press enter. Uh, this is the C alloc function, actually it's a wrapper to the dynamic call. And you can see that here we have nice types and also some names. This is not because the binary that I'm looking at contains the bug information, but these informations have been collected from the uh, C standard library, the bug information, which are basically always available. Okay, let's look at who is calling this uh, function. So I will do right click, go to references. And in line here, I will have a part of the uh, revenge UI showing me all the call site, just as you are used to do in VS code. And I can double click and it will bring me there. Okay, this is the first function that actually does something. So let's take a look. So first of all, we can see that it calls C alloc and allocates 48 bytes and then does that again. It saves the first one in var one and the second one in var zero. And after that, we can see that saves the, the pointer to the second allocation at an offset within the, 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 the data allocated by the uh, first allocation. So basically the, the first allocation will contain a pointer to the second and specifically at offset 40. Now, this is the first interesting thing about Revenge. As you can see, it has been able to automatically detect the layout of this data structure, but yeah, more on that later. And finally, it returns the first allocation. Okay, I think this allocates some things. So I will rename this to uh, object allocator. At this point, I want to see who is calling this function. So I can just control click 
and it will bring me to main. Okay, so main was calling this function. Okay, so object allocator returns a value in var2, and this variable is forwarded to another function. Let's take a look to this function. Okay, this function contains a loop. Let's try to understand the loop. The loop uh, keeps uh, looping until var0 is uh, not null, and we can see that var0 is initialized with the argument, which by the way was the result of the allocation that we have seen before, and at each iteration the value of var0 is updated with the, the content of a field within var0 itself, and specifically at offset 40, which is something that we have seen before. Now, at this point, you might recognize that this pattern is very similar to traversing a linked list. If this is a pointer to the next element of the linked list, that could be the case. Okay. But let's take a look at what Revenge was able to detect in terms of data structures layout. Uh, so I can control click on offset 40 here, and this will bring me to a new view, which is called Types and Globals and basically contains all the data structures and function prototypes that Revenge was able to automatically detect. And here we can see a struct. Okay, this struct is called struct 77, and the first thing that I notice is that the second field at offset 40 is a pointer to a struct of the same type. Okay, so Revenge, thanks to an analysis that we have, which is called data layout analysis, uh, which I will not go into detail in detail, but basically it's able to detect that this data structure contains a pointer to another instance of the same data structure, which is interesting, I think. But also the first field of the struct is, uh, is so it's kind of non-trivial because it's an array and Revenge was able to automatically detect that it's composed by five 64-bit integers. That's nice. Okay. At this, time, at this uh, point, I want to rename some stuff, so I will do right click and I can do edit type. Edit type uh, will open a new view where you can basically make all the changes that you want to the data structure. But in this case, I just want to rename the second field to next because I think it's a pointer to the next element in the linked list and the first field to data. And then I just press Ctrl S to save my changes and as you can see down here, things have been updated. At this point, I can press ESC and I'm back at the uh, original situation. I can also add comments. For instance, I can do right click, edit comment and type, this is likely the pointer to the next element. And it will pop up as Doxygen. Okay, let's go back. I can press Ctrl Alt minus, just as you would do in a Visual Studio code and we're back at our view and you can see that the next, uh, that the field of the data structure has been updated. Okay, let's go back to our loop. So at each iteration, we can see that the current element of the iteration, let's say, is forwarded to this other function. And its return value is accumulated into var1, which is initialized to zero and it's finally returned. So basically we're iterating over the linked list and we are accumulating its result in a variable and then returning it. Okay, but maybe at this point I could be curious to take a look at the disassembly. So I can, for instance, select an instruction, just press tab and it brings me to the disassembly. Or maybe I want to take a look at the control flow graph. So I can go here on the left and open the CFG. And here it is. It's not very interactive right now, but you can take a look. Okay, let's go back. At this point, I might be interested in taking a look at this function here. So maybe, maybe I can rename this function because this is like traverse linked list. And then I want to enter this function, this other function. So the argument, it's always some node of our linked list. And here we have another loop. Let's take a look at this loop. So the loop repeats until var0 is different from 5 and var0 is initialized to 0 and at each iteration it's incremented by 1. So this, loops, this loop basically repeats 5 times. And at each iteration we accumulate in var1, which is also initialized to 0, the value of a value of the data array that we have seen before and in particular the element uh, numbered depending on var0. So basically here we are accumulating 
all the values in data and then returning them. Okay. Okay, this is enough, but maybe at this point I want to invite a friend and uh, collaborate with him, right? So I will go back to the profiles and here I can press open project website and this will bring me to Hub. You can think to about Hub as basically the GitHub of reverse engineering. And by the way, you can browse things. For instance, you can go to binary and here you can see, for instance, uh, types and globals, which contains uh, the data structure that I was mentioning before. But more importantly, uh, at this time, sorry, when I have my project here, I can do, I can go here, click manage collaborators, and then can invite a friend. And specifically, I want to invite John Doe. And I click add, and now he's a member of the project. So I can just share with John Doe the link to my project. And I have another browser session ready here, where I'm logged in as John Doe. And I can just go there. And as you can see, I can see the project, but I can also click open. And this will start the Visual Studio UI for this other user. And let me put them side by side. Okay, and for instance, as John Doe here on the right, I might be willing to change the same function that I see on the left. So I can type 8D0, go to the decompiled uh, code. And then maybe I can rename this function. I can rename it to accumulate data entries. And yeah, as you can see, the rename has taken effect also for my original user in real time. So with Revenge, collaboration is extremely straightforward and it comes out of the box, which I think it's pretty interesting. Okay, one last thing I'd like to show you is the model. So the model is not something that you usually need to deal with, you know, you can use the UI uh, entirely autonomously, but the model, which is a file that you can find here, is basically the revenge project file. And it contains everything that you can customize. Again, you don't have to deal with it usually, but if you're gonna write some scripting, uh, this, is gonna, this is what you're gonna be dealing with. For instance, here, there's the list of functions and we can go to 8D0 and we can see uh, for instance, its name here. And I can make a change, for instance, add that to a trailing two. And if I do control S, it will update in the rest of the UI. As you can see, now the function is called accumulate data entries two. If you're curious to know more about this and the scripting, you can just go to docs.rev.ng and there's uh, under user manual tutorial, there's some nice uh, um, tutorial on how to write that model from scratch and start understanding how you interact with revenge in particular for scripting purposes. Okay, I think this is it. Uh, let us know what you think, give it a try. And if you find any bugs, feel free to report them. And yeah, thanks for your attention.